The open system is absolutely at the underpinning of this approach. The frame is a very standard chassis and all the pieces and parts can be interchanged. The way we feel about these things and the sort of perception of a kind of luxury is really a matter of design. It's not a matter of expensive materials or expensive windows. It's just a matter of where you put your effort. Human settlements take on a certain inertia and stasis. And people make their, they make their neighborhoods and their relationships. That really started the way we wanted to think about post-disaster housing. Oh, we're in the city, there's not a lot of space. We can make a high-density post-disaster community with the expectation that it might be in place for a very long time and it might become a permanent community. We've been doing things that have not been done before, yes. And that, of course, leads to it, uh, very hard work. My name is Jim Garrison. I am the principal of Garrison Architects, and I am a professor at the Pratt Institute. And the, uh, we are in Brooklyn, New York, uh, near the Brooklyn Bridge. The project we are looking at, and we're going to take a walk through, is the Office of Emergency Management, FEMA, Corps of Engineers, uh, Interim Emergency Prototype Housing. It means it's second tier housing after a, uh, after a disaster. We're uh, an architecture firm that has become involved in quick response projects and housing and projects uh, that, that concern themselves with social equity and social uh, problems generally. Not a commercially focused office. We're an office, we're basically a research-based office that does many, many things. We do robotic arrays for Verizon. We do housing for, you know, the affordable housing community. We do market rate housing, college and university building triple net zero mixed use building in Albany, New York. It's a, a model for carbon neutral building in the future. And over years has been that we've combined the, the technology and rapid delivery side with social need to more affordable and better quality. So this was actually a big stepping stone in that direction and in, in under, better understanding what it means to rebuild after something like, in this case, Hurricane Sandy. Hurricane Sandy was the end of 2007. We had been looking at post-disaster scenarios for several years through the, the academic research side uh, in, at Fed Institute with uh, students from all over the world. Many of our students had actually experienced natural disasters, aftermath of the Osaka uh, earthquake in Japan and seeing that people moved into uh, what were meant to be temporary shelters and 20 years later, they were still there and they did not want to leave or go to the permanent place. Human settlements take on a certain inertia and stasis. And people, make their, they make their neighborhoods and their relationships. That really started the way we wanted to think about post-disaster housing. A wonderful architect who worked for the Office of, of Emergency Management named Cynthia Bart, who saw that this was something we needed to look at and think about. And Cynthia uh, initiated a competition. It was a design build competition. And she brought together FEMA and the Office of Emergency Management and the Corps of Engineers into a, a single group. They funded this, really a million dollar fund. And a variety of people responded, 30 or 40 entries, I think. Sandy was really the instigator, right? Now that Sandy's over, <laughs> we've lost some of our, uh, our momentum. So I'm actually standing uh, near the uh, Office of Emergency Management. They had this piece across the street next to uh, the local utility substation. See that this is three stories uh, with a, a two-story portion. It's essentially a prefabricated townhouse. It's a walk-up. We wanted a building that we could make a street and a neighborhood out of, that we could set side by side and repeat. And that, that was really key for this. Part of the motivation on the part of the Corps of Engineers was that they'd had such a difficult time with the, uh, the Katrina trailers. They were using up an awful lot of land. There's a lot of infrastructure costs that are spread all over. Oh, we're in the city. There's not a lot of space. We can make a high-density post-disaster community with the expectation that it might be in place for a very long time and it might become a permanent community. The materials and the durability are such that it'll last as long as any building. This particular building was made to be disassembled and taken to another site. And they all could be, but it's never a very easy thing to do. 
And the preparation of the sites, the utilities that are necessary, they're, they're really the challenge when it yeah. comes to uh, you know, recovering or even building every day. The most difficult thing to bring back online after a disaster are the utilities. The building has a kind of primary three-story component in the center. And on the side, there are these two slightly smaller units. Now those are uh, contain two bedrooms. So the core unit, which is repetitive, one bedroom, 480 square foot, one bedroom unit. And then it can be expanded to become a three bedroom unit with the addition of this piece on the side. But this piece on the side can also, for every, say, 10 houses, be substituted with a container-based infrastructure system that has water, waste storage, and electrical generation capacity. They're really units that are already in production, used for military purposes. So it takes two years to set up uh, infrastructure, then those pieces can be removed. They can be pulled out of place, place uh, bedroom units in their, in their stead. These units are lifted a bit above the ground yeah. and all the utilities can be connected horizontally underneath the units. So basically these, these infrastructure units and the typical infrastructure for the street comes in from the ground and ties in, either going up to the temporary units or down to the permanent infrastructure. You have sort of double purpose in mind for these. These are about 40 feet long and they, they sit very nicely in a variety of open spaces that we have. We're to place these in the parking lots of our public housing projects. We could do a couple of things. We could bring a kind of street sensibility, also provide temporary housing, housing that would allow the restoration, the renovation of the public housing that we have. These are spread footings, cement here that goes down in four feet below the surface and it finds enough bearing to basically spread out and hold the building up. In some cases, we had utilities crossing the site, isolated connection, I think you can see that. That is a water connection. There's a transfer beam uh, behind us, we're at the back where the little utility uh, entrance is. This is a material called galvalum, which is used in a lot of uh, agricultural uh, buildings and so forth, a very, very good uh, material because it's pre-finished, it, it does not rust, it lasts a long time and it's not very expensive. This is designed to contemporary standards and the frame on this is very robust. And th this is capable of, of taking 150 mile an hour winds. This is a very robust piece of work. Also built to contemporary energy standards. And what's the width of each of these modules? 12, they're 12 feet wide. One of the conundrums in uh, what, what we call volumetric modular housing is that the width of a container is only eight feet and inside it's less than eight feet. And that's really not wide enough for all the things that you know people need, bathrooms, kitchens, entries, all that. And it doesn't meet the American with Disabilities Act, so it's inadequate. And it's very complex to stitch two containers together along a seam running down their center. We are able, with provisions and permits, to ship 12 foot or in most states up to 14 feet wide units across the highways. 12 feet is falls within one of the permit classifications that's, that's easiest and less expensive than wider. We don't need to go wider. This, this does the job for us without getting into the complexities of dealing with container dimensions. The amenities that are included in such housing are politically sensitive. There is a balcony system with sliding doors and there are VRF heat pump condensers on those balconies. Aesthetically, that is not our first choice, but it has a great benefit because it allows these units to be completed in the factory without having to set up these uh, heating and uh, air conditioning systems in the field. They can be serviced. But the use of a balcony uh, and as a provision is something that shallow balcony, but it really transforms the units and it, and it gives people a kind of presence and sense of the street. The, the idea is eyes on the street, community yeah. engagement with the street. The stairway is, a, is another module. It's made as one piece. So we're coming in underneath the entry. A 40 foot chassis, that's a tilted up. That's right, that's right. Yeah. that works. The slope does not build up in these open stairwells. How is the stairwell connected? You can see it right here, actually. There is a connection plate, actually it's in the floor and at the ceiling that allows, the, that allows them to be connected. So it's a, it's a mechanical folded connection. The evolution of our expertise in prefabrication has been a matter of, of slowly removing more and more of the on-site trades from the equation. The prefabrication and on-site construction do not uh, marry very well. It's very hard to establish this, what we call the scope. We want that this to be as 
simple as possible. So this building, for instance, we're looking at the side wall of the uh, where two modules meet. And the only thing missing when these arrived was that horizontal band that we're looking at below us. And that was provided by the factory, put in place by the modular workers. That buttoned everything up and put everything together. We had a bit of roofing to do to overlap, but this is finished to a very high degree. The thing that's really different about this is that it's non-combustible. The, the vast majority of, of housing of this kind, four-story housing that we build in the United States is made out of uh, wood. We cannot allow wood in our cities because of the fire risk. The wood that you see is, is called blocking. It's really just meant for attachments. The manufacturer of the units in this case was a company called Markline. Uh, Markline is now out of business. Actually, manufacturing is a very volatile industry. One of the challenges that we have in construction is that construction is heavily affected by economic cycles. So we lose expertise and business capacity uh, every time there's a downturn. It doesn't help our ability. So it's hard to build company. institutional knowledge when it's not supported. That's right. That's right. At the moment, we, we are working on uh, developing a modular uh, production facility for housing liaison with local community colleges so that we can uh, an established training routine. This is, a, this is a simple building. It's made out of easily a, a readily available steel stock, uh, light gauge framing, materials that come from. It's meant to be a building, a series of modules that anyone can build. When there's a disaster and you need a thousand units, you can't go to a single factory and rely on them to produce them. You've got to go to several factories. The classic example of the open system was the, the traditional 10-speed bicycle. All the components could be interchanged onto a common frame. The frame is a very standard chassis, and all the pieces and parts can be interchanged. The open system is absolutely at the underpinning of this approach. The core unit, which is the third floor, uh, and, and the portions of the first and second floor is a 480 square foot, very compact one bedroom unit. Lower floors have the side unit, which in the case of the second floor has two bedrooms. In the case of the first floor is a conference room. So you can vary the mix according to how many families or individuals you have to house. I'm coming through the kitchen. The kitchen is made out of phenolic multi-lamb plywood. It's very rough and tough. Uh, this is the view out the front balcony and uh, the park beyond. There is cabinetry, um, furnished, of course, because people don't really have furnishings. Very compact kitchen that you can see we walk through. And it's designed to universal design standards. Roll in kitchen and workspaces adjacent to the stove, the width uh, for uh, wheelchair access, bathroom. Also, universal design standards. Bathroom is designed with a roll-in shower. I don't know if I can get a good view of it. And all the uh, resources it needs to be completely accessible. So, and, the, and the tiling, all the appliances, or how, how much of this was completed when it was delivered on site? This interior was 100% complete, including wow. the furniture. So just as you see it without the... Well, without the bed linens, this is the bedroom, which is a, which is compact, but it gives, if, if two people are occupying this, it gives you a bit of privacy, it's kind of window that is really the width of a door, and it, and it fits the human body, so it has a nice proportion to it. It lets the light and the space flow beyond the wall. Two kinds of windows, perhaps, the, the, the window that is a picture frame, and the window that interrupts the wall. When we interrupt the wall, we create a feeling of space extending beyond ourselves. So it breaks up the kind of narrow dimension that we're working with. Because you're going 12 feet wide, turn the kitchen horizontally, gives you the illusion that it's a much wider home as well. It's a little trick uh, being played here where the table, the kitchen table, which is also the dining table, is an extension of the counter and floats in the middle of the room, appears to be really a table and not part of the kitchen, although it serves double duty, it tricks the sort of sensibilities in the eye a bit. 480 square feet is a tiny one bedroom. And these are smaller than what most people live in, even in New York. The reaction we always get when people walk into this, whether they're a fellow spent the night in here from the New York Times who wrote an article about it, talked about how the fact was it was nicer than what he, what he was living in. 
Well, there's actually less space. The way we feel about these things and the sort of perception of a kind of luxury is really a matter of design. It's not a matter of, of expensive materials or expensive windows. It's just a matter of where you put your effort. One of the reactions we would get from this, from this unit was, this is too nice. People will want to stay in that. I thought that was the point. Who do you find people most often have a misperception of? There is this general confusion about what these kinds of buildings are, are meant to be used for. It's temporary housing for the homeless, or there's a confusion on, on the government's part about whether or not we should be prepared to build housing like this when there is a disaster, how we should rebuild. And after, you know, as, as in most things, after Sandy and the sort of pressure was released, you know, we stopped really worrying about it. Our point of confusion, I think, culturally is how we are going to proceed to design, build, and make the housing we need. Just a, a tremendous amount of confusion about who deserves it, how we'll build it, where it'll go. All those things are attached to this housing. We saw a lot of innovative aspects of this, but what would you say is sort of the, the most innovative aspect? In the end, architecture is always an emotional art. You have to, when you occupy a building that's been thoughtfully designed, it's got to feel good and give you a certain sense of well-being. That's what I want out of the world. I want it to be a place where you or I or anyone else can occupy this and feel good and feel uh, ennobled by being in it. Love it. What's the next well, step of this? We, we've taken the DNA of this forward and we're attempting to start a, an automated factory that would produce something very similar to this, very, a very simple, robust, open system frame that we can use for housing up to 10 stories in this case. All of this has been research that's been allowing us to keep stepping forward to the promise of a really high quality, well-organized prefabrication scenario. So we're working on that right now. None, none of that's been lost. Culture is responding to a lot of startups. I think over the next 10 years, we're going to see a renaissance of this kind of thing. It's really a, it's really catching hold. Well, Jim, thank you for the tour. Well, it's really a pleasure. Take care. Okay, bye-bye.